every rhinoplasty is a preservation rhinoplasty unless you are a clumsy surgeon. You know, you try to preserve the mucosa, you try to preserve the valve areas, you try to preserve the cartilage as much as you can, the soft tissue. Otherwise, you're not a good surgeon. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast Season 3, where we're doing face-to-face -face interviews. And we're coming to you from Brussels at the European Rhinoplasty Course. And I've got a man on today's podcast who is somebody I have been trying to interview for three years, but it is so difficult to get hold of Professor Hossam Foda. And finally, I've got to be at Brussels and we can have a chat. Hossam, it's great to see you again. And thank you for being on this episode. It is my pleasure, Cameron. It's my pleasure. So, awesome. I the first time I met you, it was actually when I was at, with Russ Crydell in Houston, and I saw your picture, and I thought, oh, there's another African guy who's crazy like noses. And, I mean, you did a fellowship with him. Yeah, that was 1990. 1990. Goodness. Was, uh, 30, 33 years ago. So, tell the listeners about your journey in rhinoplasty. How did... This guy from Africa ended up in Houston and now ended up being one of the doyens of rhinoplasty globally. I tell you how it started. When I, I come from an ENT background, so I finished my residency in ENT and all my practice was head and neck surgery. Mm -hmm. I love to do head and neck surgery because it makes you feel like a real surgeon, you know, okay. removing larynx, doing uh, pull ups, doing radical neck dissections, thyroid makes you not working through a hole in the ear and, you know, with a microscope and that's it. So uh, at the end, you know, these are all cancer patients, so they have complications. Yeah. So you enter the department every day, you're surrounded by like 10 people, everyone has a complication. This one's got a fistula, this one's not swallowing, this one has a problem with the probox, so there is a stoma recurrence, there is an irradiation problem, and they're all very depressing, you know? So I decided when I, when I shifted to my doctorate degree, I said I would choose a branch where I would operate on a patient, the patient would be happy. Yes. He'll meet me somewhere, hug me, send me a thank you note, you know? I, I want to change my life. So I chose the facial plastic as the subject for my uh, doctorate degree thesis. And the nearest thing to ENT was the nose. Yeah. I won't do a MD thesis on facelifts or yeah. air. So I chose the nose. At that time, there were a few eminent rhinoplasty surgeons who come from uh, ENT background. So it was like Tony Bone in London. It was like Goodman in Canada. Uh, I was actually communicating with the uh, with uh, what's his name, uh, William Wright in uh, Houston. He was the professor of Russell Crider. Okay. But at that time he retired and Russell Crider was okay. in charge of the practice. Yeah. So uh, the quickest communication came from Tony Wood and from Russell Crider. And at that time, Tony Wood was doing only close. And Russell Crider was doing open okay. Brian Plus because William K. Wright was a pioneer in the open approach. So I chose to go to Russ, and that was 1990. It, it went very smooth, and I went there and stayed for a couple of years. Uh, I did my doctorate degree thesis, which was uh, about 250 rhinoplasties, wow. analyzing the open approach. Yeah. And I had to go back to Egypt to defend my uh, thesis. Yeah which I did, and uh, I became appointed as a lecturer uh, in my department. Yeah. At that stage, I decided to do only facial plastics, not, no more ENT. So I started a subdivision in my department, which is a facial plastic surgery subdivision in the ENT department. Okay. It was the first among all the Egyptian universities. Wow. We have like 20 universities in Egypt. None of them have a subdivision of facial plastic. Well, in no, no university in Africa had a subdivision. No one had this. And it was a big fight with the general 
plastic surgery to pop. Yeah. You know, there are heart liners and how come facial plastic will go to the ENT and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I was very well protected by my professors yeah. in my department because they know I'm very well trained. And your PhD. And they know I'm very well trained. They don't yeah. want any complications, you know. So I started doing everything in, in, in facial plastic. I did hair, I did facelifts, I did blepharoplasties, I did my crochet repairs, I did everything in facial plastics. Mm. And then the residents came to rotate in my unit in every three months. Whoever is interested in facial plastic will stay in the facial plastic division. So the division started getting bigger and bigger. So I supervised ME and PhD thesis on uh, facelifts, on nasal uh, reconstruction with flaps, on uh, on main subject. Yeah. And everyone will sub-specialize in something in facial plastic. So they are now covering everything and I'm not doing anything in the department anymore. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, was a, it was a nice journey. I'm not regretting it at all. And but now you're in private practice. I'm in private practice since day one, because in Egypt you can be a full-time professor and have your private clinic. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So in the afternoon you can have your private clinic and operate on your private cases and everything. Okay. Because they don't pay you in the university a big salary. No, no, no. It's a very small salary at the university, but you get the position and the residence and the uh, facilities yeah. that you need for research and everything. But you, you have two private practices. You, you, it's yeah. not like it's, you love traveling and you're traveling all over the world. But you also love some men say to even travel within Egypt. I travel within Egypt every week because I have a practice in Cairo and the practice in Alexandria. Yeah. So three, the, the first three days, which is Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I'm in Alexandria. And then Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I'm in Cairo every week. Yeah. Unless I'm out of the country. And they have another practice to buy another practice. Wait, so I, I travel a lot. <laughs> wow. And um, I'm enjoying you in South Africa. <laughs> I know. You, you've come and we hope next year for the World Run and Plus today we'll get you out there again to watch it, come and come and see things. And and so like this is a this is a career of like 40 years plus. Um this new resurgent wave of preservation right at last. What are some of your thoughts around? Actually, I like, I have seen lots of things come and go. Let's put it that way. Mm. Uh, even in the piezo, I, I was among the first, uh, let's say, expert group that they chose, the, the company chose to design the inserts and mm -hmm. do the uh, research on the piezo. That was maybe 15 years ago. Uh, it was Olivier, me, and Rick Davis, and Henri Corobotti, and Barry Shacker, and uh, Gotsel, and uh, these are the people I, I actually remember. Henri Corobotti showed uh, a slide about that group. And I stayed working with Piezo for a while, and I didn't find that it's giving me a major advantage to keep doing everything mm -hmm. using the read, you know. Even for a lateral osteotomy, it takes a longer time. For a small hump, it takes a longer time. And it's not adding a big benefit. For me to shift, I have to have a major advantage mm -hmm. in order to shift. But if I can do the thing in a different way, in a more simple and faster, I will stay doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, now, part of the preservation, which is your question, yeah. I skipped that. The, the preservation has been there for hundreds of years mm. and people stop the preservation because of the incidence of complication and hump recurrence and uh, step deformities and blah, blah. Now the techniques has been refined considerably. Yes. By using the, pre uh, it became more precise. It became more accurate. It became more the, uh, doing it through an open approach, you know, no. so many, many things made the complications less and less. But what I'm against is the term preservation. Mm -hmm. That's my only concern because uh, every rhinoplasty is a preservation rhinoplasty unless you are a clumsy surgeon. You know, you try to preserve the mucosa, you try to preserve the 
value is you try to preserve the cartilage as much as you can, the soft tissue, otherwise you're not a good surgeon. Mm. But the term preservation, if you're not doing preservation, you're doing a destructive rhinoplasty. No, it's not true. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, it's not true. Yeah, because it almost it's to say that my way is the only way. Yeah. But it's not necessary. And people are still getting excellent results without doing preservation. Yeah. Well, what, what does a preservation preserve? Preserves the junction of the upper laterals with the dorsal capillary septum at the keystone area. Other than that, it is destroying everything else. Sure. Like the bones, like the yeah. uh, septum, like yeah. the everything. Okay, last question um, before we go to our last session is you're obviously teaching all over the world at different conferences, but if somebody wants to come and learn from you, is there a possibility that people can actually come to Cairo or Alexandria and learn? Do you run any courses or anything like that? Actually, uh, I get visiting surgeons from everywhere, but I have my own fellowship, which is a unique fellowship. It's a hands-on life surgery fellowship. So the, it's for a limited number of surgeons and they come and scrub. And my role is to instruct them on what to do and what not to do. So they are working with the, with their own hands. Wow. Whatever I do on the right side, they get to do on the left side. So we do like 14 cases in one week and they will uh, get a consider. And have you had some long-term follow-up on those patients to see which side you operate? Oh, no, so I've been out, right? I would never, I would never make the, the anesthetist wake up the patient if I'm not totally satisfied with it. So, it's beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, awesome. it's great to chat to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for what you do for the world of rhinoplasty. And uh, you all, I hope you have a great year. I would like to compliment one thing, your energy and enthusiasm for rhinoplasty, because that's a, something which is so evident for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Thanks. Guys, yeah. thank you so much for uh, tuning into this episode of the Rhinoplast podcast. Make sure that you back next week for our next episode. Mm -hmm.